form of dying and death. It's, it's horrible to study all of those. Uh, and that little book that I wrote there, a little great grammar that you have, uh, it's got all little kinds of information. You can get a grammar this thick, and that little book has got just about everything that all the other grammars do, but maybe even more, because I give you the, um, the history of the Greek language and the history of the English Bible. Uh, and uh, the text of the Greek text, the history of the Greek text. If you read those first two stories in the beginning of that, you'll know more about uh, the Bible and Greek than most pastors do in that. Uh, it's kind of a, a lost study today. I don't know why they quit studying Greek and Hebrew. Baptist, real Baptist, taught from Greek and Hebrew for 2,000 years, ever since the Lord called out his church. And uh, just recently now they have their doctorates in the English Bible. But I'll just say this one thing. Most pastors stay in the church five years, and they run out of soap. If you study the Greek and the Hebrew, you're never going to run out of soap. It's going to be a new world every day if you stay. It's uh, tremendous. What you can find in those languages is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, we study the Greek and the Hebrew from the text of the Bible. On Sunday afternoon, I'm teaching Hebrew from Genesis. And uh, on Wednesday night, we're doing the book of Galatians. Now, we've done, if you go to the website, and if you go to discovertheword.com and go over there to the audio Bible study directory, you will see hundreds of classes in Greek that I've taught here. I've been teaching here for, I think it's 14 years here, Greek for 14 years. Of course, I've done a lot of books. I teach Greek by induction or by doing it. Learn by doing it. If you go out there on the job, uh, used to, when you went out in the oil fields, you went to work in the oil fields that day. And you learned it by doing it. If you lived through it, <laughs> you had a job. If you didn't, they buried you. Simple as that. Well, Greek is a, a beautiful language. The, uh, the Greek language goes back into uh, eons of time. We don't know how far back it goes. Uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, the Greek language. It was in the dialects, what we call the dialects. Ionic and Attic. Attic. Does anybody know what Attic or Ionic means? Those are two of the dialects, two of the major dialects of Greek. Attic means that which was spoken in Athens. Okay, Athens. And Ionic means that which was spoken in Ionia. Okay. And the word Greek uh, is Helis, Helenotrope. Okay, that's where it comes from. Well, as we study the Bible, we're going to learn some beautiful Bible doctrines, and you'll learn a tremendous amounts, and you'll find out that you know a lot of Greek already, especially if you're in any medical field. Uh, the medical field is totally in Greek. Everything's Greek. All the language in the medical language is Greek. In the legal language, in the lawyer language, the, uh, the uh, language of the corpse is Latin. If you go back and, and you study about the Greek language, I'm giving you a little bit of synopsis of what's in those little introductions there. You'll find out that it goes way back in, to millennia in the, in the dialects, and then it goes into the classical. And then Koine. Koine, about 330 or 40, 50 BC, on to about 330, 40, 50, actually about 400 AD, actually, uh, is where the, the uh, Koine Greek, uh, the Koine means common language. The movie The Passion uh, should have been done in, and not in Aramaic, but in Greek, Koine Greek, but where are they gonna find somebody to speak Koine Greek? It's a lot easier to find Aramaic speaking, Yiddish people, all right? But the uh, Greek is a little bit rougher. The modern Greek language is not like this. You go from, uh, back to here is uh, Christ right here. Back this side of it, we have the dialects, okay? And then you have the uh, classical, and then Koine. And 
It goes all the way over here on this side of the cross, so almost 400 AD. And why, what happened to, to lose the Greek language? The Bible was written in Greek, the New Testament, even the Old Testament was written in Greek. The Septuagint, any time you see that, you'll see the, that means Septuagint, the Septuagint. All right, the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation that was done about 300 uh, BC uh, from the Hebrew into the Greek. And uh, they and I will use Hebrewisms as we study Greek. You're going to have to study a little bit of Hebrew also. Okay. Let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to get into studying here. Brother David, would you lead us in prayer, please, brother? Okay. Dear God, Lord in heaven, we are. Uh, so happy to be here today to learn your word from, from the hard work and the teaching of Jim. We pray for those in the class that cannot be here. Keep our minds and our hearts open throughout the week to come. And we, as always, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, that looks like the thing to record. I have to double check these machines sometimes. Well, if you get over here to about 400 A.D., why did the Greek Bible cease to exist about 400 A.D.? Do you remember why? The church. Jerome. Now, the Catholic Church had evolved and was married to church to the state. And uh, the Latin language, now the Roman Empire used Greek. They, some of the legal language was Latin, but most of the, even the Roman coins were printed in Greek. Did you know that? They were printed in Greek. You go back and you find that out. <coughs> okay. Uh, Jerome, <coughs> he translated the Old Testament and the New Testament into Latin. And that was, and that took the Bible out of the hands of the common man. Because Latin was, a, was the language of the intellectuals. Okay. Not so much intellectuals, but the doctors and lawyers in the legal system. All right? And the Catholic Church made the Latin Bible the only Bible which you could have. And the reason why they did that is to take it out of the hands of the common man so they would not know what the Bible taught. Make it a foreign book. And then when they would get up and do the, the uh, Mass in Latin, <coughs> the people would only follow what they had been taught to do. Okay. Now the Catholic Church evolved. You know, it wasn't. It didn't believe all the things it believed in the very beginning. It evolved one step at a time. But once uh, the Church had control, well, we talked about the Church and how there were true churches all that time. The churches didn't go out of existence. God's churches were always there. We wouldn't have a Bible if those churches didn't exist. Tell me, you wouldn't have a Bible. Well, after about 400 A.D. The church state, which was a Roman Catholic church, it was against the law to preach in any other language but in Latin. And uh, they had to, you had to have a certificate of ordination by them to preach. And I just want to tell you this little thing here. How many of you ever heard of St. Patrick? St. Patrick was a Baptist. St. Patrick was an English Baptist. He was uh, captured by the Irish cutthroats, basically cannibals, and he was taken into Ireland. He was uh, enslaved there, and he escaped and went back to England, and then God put a burden on his heart to go back to Ireland to preach to these people. All right? He was in a primitive Baptist church. And if you study the uh, Catholics' own idea of, of uh, uh, St. Patrick, you'll find out they'll say that he was a primitive Christian, not a Catholic. A primitive Christian was a Baptist. Right. He went in and established 365 churches in Ireland and established deacons and preachers in every one of those churches. And the Catholic Church said, you have no authority to do this. And he just said, beat it. <laughs> All right. And he went on doing his own thing. He baptized, uh, they say, by his own hands, thousands of, of individuals. And by the way, baptism was uh, baptizo. 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 What does that mean? It means to immerse. The Latin equivalent to that is merdio. 
We got our word from a verse out of Murphy Hill. All right. Now, if I wanted to sprinkle somebody, what would be the Greek word that I would use for sprinkling? Rontizo. I'm just giving you a little bit of a rontizo. You have a rough breather over the top of that roll there. Okay. Now, if I wanted to uh, uh, pour something on somebody, what would I? What Greek word would I use? Nipto. Nipto. All right. Nipto. That's the word. Nipto. So we know that immersion is the only form of baptism. And by the way, they weren't doing anything else back then. The very few examples of what we call a, 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 a fusion. A fusion. That's something else besides immersion for baptism. One guy was sick one time and they wanted to baptize him. That's crazy. You know, back in those days, they thought that if a man got real wet, he'd probably die. Those people over in Europe didn't take baths. Did you know that? They were afraid of the water. Wash their hand, wash their face a little bit. That's about it. Maybe wash their feet. But they didn't take baths. And uh, they started equating baptism with salvation. You had to be baptized to be saved. Baptists always thought that you baptized believers to join the church someplace. All right? And the first churches, by the way, were not built as congregation places for people to sit down. They were Baptist streets. They had a, a building, and there was uh, just basically a hall that you walked in up there, and there was a baptistry, a font up there, a big font, a big giant bathtub, baptistry like that. And they always dipped everybody. Later on, uh, they had this one guy that was real sick, and they thought, well, now we've got to get him all under the water because baptism needs to immerse. So they got a whole great big tub of water, and they brought it over there and poured it on him and made sure that he was absolutely covered up with the water. And that was the first example of a fusion. I don't know, Bill. I'm upset with a lot of them. I invited a guy to class tonight here. I just stopped in to see if he, if he came. Okay. Okay. All right. See you later, Bill. Yes, sir. All right. Um, anyway, that can kind of give you a little bit of idea about Greek and what Greek can do for us. A little bit. Okay, you're going to study history as you, as you study through these classes. Now we're doing the book of Galatians 4 and 4. I have written an inline here on all of the New Testament. You will have one, I hope, next week. Could you show them that, brother? Hold that up there. It's, it's the book of Galatians, the inline here, and commentary. And uh, there's even the page numbers you can go look up in, in the analytical lexicons and look all this up. Sometimes if I am quoting Thayer or something, I'll put down Thayer's page number. I don't do anything with Strong's or uh, that, that at all. I just forget that. You just go to the source. Forget the baby stuff. All right? We're going to go to the source. Four and four is a really a good lesson. Four and four. We're going to read Greek, and you read Greek, and uh, we will. Uh, you look on. Can he look on with you, or do you have a Greek Bible there, brother? Um, it's got this. has got like a strong. Oh, okay. Well, look on there with him. Yes. Right. No, you're in the linear. That's the end of linear. You're going to have next week, hopefully. It should be here. All right. Uh, we're going to read the Greek, and you'll learn what the words look like, and you'll find out that Greek looks a whole lot like English, because English came from Greek. So did Latin. So did Spanish. All this. This is where it originated, okay? Now, that first word there looks just like English. Except it's got a rough breather on it. Remember I told you about this rough breather right here? So that puts an H on it. Hrontizo. So how would you say that first word there? Hotel. Mm -hmm. All right. And by the way, I've always said, and it does work, if you stay in the class for three years and not study any Greek at home, all of a sudden one of these days you're going to wake up and you can read Greek. Isn't that right, Meryl? Mm -hmm. She, after about three years in the class, she came to the class one day and she never looked at Greek one time at home. And she said, I can read this. <laughs> And she did. She wanted to read it. She wanted to read the whole verse. You'll be able to do that. And the next word is almost like English, too. So we have hote, and they, we have uh, what? Okay. Day. Day. Now, that funny-looking little thing there, it's a, de it's a delta. <coughs> okay? Delta. De delta epsilon. And then elthone. 
That's a little harder. It's got some words that don't quite look like English. Elthone, and then the next word you can read. Toe. All right? And then play Roma. Say play Roma. And then the next word you can read in English? Two. Two. Cronu. Ex a pe stele. And then the next word is an O, all right, but it's got a rough breather on it. So what is that? Ho. Ho. Ho theos. All right, ho theos. Tone. Quion. Out to, and that looks just like it would in English. Okay. Gegnomeno. Ek. Ginaikos. Ganomeno. And then hippo. No moan. All right, that right there right there we're going to quit. Because the fifth verse starts down there, and I don't know why I did this so many years ago. But I did this, I don't know why I started on the next verse there. I usually turn the page. But I made a mistake here. All right. Pote de Alton, to play Roma, to Cronu, ex a pestalain, potheos, ton, weon, alton, ganomenon, ex dinaitos, ganomenon, hippo, monomo. All right. Now let's go back and look at these words. All right. Pote. That's a little old adverb of time there. Pote. When. And it, actually, this sentence starts out with a weak adverse to conjunctive particle, and that's day. Right? Day. Pote day, but in your mind it'll say, but when came, El day came. That comes from Erkomai. All right? That's third person singular, second Harris, and dignity back verb. El thing. Okay? You know anything about tenses? Anybody know anything about tenses? Well, this is pretty good. We're going to teach you a little bit about it. All right? There it is. In Greek, every the definite article, the, that's a definite article, poga, ristra, colon, arthro, in Greek, that's the term for it. All right, every indefinite article is a like an arrow. All right, point to something, it's very important. There are no indefinite articles in Greek. What's an indefinite article? A or N. It is the. All right. Now, the first one we come to there is, uh, but when came, all right, the fullness of the time, to chrono. That's genitive, singular, masculine. All right? You can even put it in the ablative. Now, there's eight cases in Greek. Nominative, genitive, ablative, locative, instrumental, native, accusative, and locative. Eight of them, okay? In English, you have the subject and the object. That's it. In Greek, you've got eight cases. Tells you every little bit of what's going on in that verse. No guessing. All right? And in that book there, that little book that you have, it'll have all of this down there, okay? I'm just kind of giving you a, a brief deal. Now, and when came, it came the fullness of time. It came. All right? That's the way we're going to translate this hail phone, okay? Hail L thing, that is. L thing. That's third person singular. Now let's look and find. Now we got we got we got the nouns. The nouns, the definite articles, the adjectives, and all of that are going to have eight cases. Alright, now don't get scared to death about this. You're going to learn a little of this out of time. Okay? And I'm not I say I'm not floundering you with this thing and foundering you with it. All one time I'm just giving you a little bit at a time, okay? Verbs are first, second, and third person singular and plural, okay? Now this is a third person singular, all right? First person singular is what? I, second person, you, all right? Third person, me. Uh, a she or an it. Okay? First person plural is what? We, you, or ye all, or y'all in Oklahoma. Okay? 
down that leg. And then there's an infinity down there also. That's the two something or other. Two meters, two gold, whatever. Okay? So here we have third person singular. And here, when the fullness of time came, and since time is a is a neuter type of an idea, okay, we're gonna say, but when it came, it came, the fullness. Alright. The fullness is an omnitive singular neuter. Hey or to pro roma. That means fullness. When the fullness of time, all right, had come. Now, this is third person singular, it. And then it's second aorist. There's all kinds of tenses. In English, you have a past tense. It's done, done. In future, it will be done kind of idea, but you have to explain it. Okay? I shall go with you next week. That's future. All right? I have, I went with you last week. Past. And I'm going with you now. Or I go. All right? Now in Greek, there's a whole lot more to it. All right? This is second error. Second error. Eris tense is a punctiliar action. That's a point of time action. Like a gunshot. Okay? Boom! Okay? Point of time action. Now, second aorist is a little bit durativelyly here, but still punctiliar action. Okay. Now that you don't understand this yet, but you're going, you just hang around a little bit. You're going to understand it. Okay. You'll understand. <clears throat> I had a Greek that uh, from Athens, Greece, uh, came to my class. How many times did he come? About six different times, in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> he had studied Greek in, in Athens, and he had studied at UCLA and uh, USC and a few other places. They came in my class and see, I'm explaining all these tenses and things to you. And he said, you ought to be a professor in New York City or something. He said, I've been to all these places that no teacher ever taught the way you teach with the action and stuff. He said, when you get through with it, you know what it's about. He just throw it out there. Second error, first error, whatever. All right? I want you to understand the time, okay? And when it came the fullness, the complete fullness, nominative singular, neuter, of the chrono. Now we get a word chronology from that, or a word chronograph from that. All right? There's where it comes from, right out of that Greek word right there. Chronology and, and chronograph. All right? Chrono. All right? Genitive singular. All right? Genitive singular masculine. That's what that is. The fullness of time is genitive singular masculine. That's where it's coming from. All right? The fullness of time. He sent forth with authority, and who did it? Hotheos. Hotheos is nominative singular masculine. Now, people say, is God a man or a woman, or an it? We know that he's uh, masculine. In Greek, there's nominative, genitive, all right, nominative, genitive, uh, ablative, Locative, instrumental, dative, accusing, and vocative cases. Nominative cases, subject. So that's the guy that's going to do the acting. All right? And that's who did the acting here. All right? When the fullness of time have come, God sent forth his son. We have, a, we have another verb. All right? Uh, here, we have third person singular, first heiress, indicative, active. God sent forth his son. By the way, that's Paul Killier, actually. That's a real... Called Chillier, rifle shot, action, first error. Okay? The God, the Son of Him, all right, He sent forth. That word, ek, have you ever heard of the word apostle? Apostle, okay? Ek, now look up there at that sign up there, we're out that door. See that right there? What does it say? Ek it is what it literally says. It means literally out of it. That's what exit means, or ek it. Out of it. And we have a word here, right out of the Greek. That word in Greek, now it's changed here just a little bit. The word in Greek is this word, which you can see, you can read that in English, can't you? Okay? And right here, it's got this for euphony. Euphony means good sound. X. X a pesta lay. We got a word apostle out of that. 
apostle. Apostle. Who is an apostle? Who is an apostle? The word apostle, apostle. That's where it comes from. I hear apostolos are apostles. This word breaks down to apol and stello. It's like that. Apol and stello. Apol means from. And stello means to send. But this word here means to send out with some special authority. This is like a, 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 a king's uh, entourage. Someone very important is going out there with a lot of authority, and if you mess with this guy, you're a dead meat. Simple as that. Apostle. The word apostle was a, a, a common word when Jesus came along, so they knew what an apostle was. It's someone sent out with, a, with tremendous authority. And guess what he did? He ordained 12 apostles. And what were the 12 apostles? What were they? It tells you later on. The 12 apostles were the first gift given to the church. That was the first gift placed in the church. Ecclesia. Okay? Ecclesia. Ecclesia. That comes from Ec. Here we see that word again. And call you. All right. The word church means what? One's called out. When did Jesus call his church out? When did he begin to call his church? The circle. Galilee means the circle. When he went around Galilee, he began to call his church out. All right? And later, later on, then he placed 12 apostles in that church. Did that church baptize anybody? Before the day of Pentecost? Huh? They sure did. Did they have a treasure before the day of Pentecost? Did they have apostles before the day of Pentecost? Did they ever preach before the day of Pentecost? How big was that church? Huh? How big was that church? Five thousand. Huh? Five thousand. Well, there's a little term used for five thousand, five to ten thousand, and there's a term used for ten thousand plus. Oh, close. Is at least. Five to ten thousand. Oh, Chloe, when you use that term, this is the word for crowd. That's for ten thousand above. We find out that several times there was an old Chloe around Jesus. Not just old Chloe. All right, old Chloe. How many did he feed a couple of different times? How many thousands? Okay. That was a little ecclesia around him. Not all of them were faithful followers, but they were a, a gathering of people. Okay? And the word church does not mean church house. It is the assembly. All right? It would be better translated assembly rather than church. Uh, long chain. The word for church house is synagogue. By the way. And the Greek, or the, the Jews had quit using their language. Many years before that, when the, Jesus came along, very few Hebrews knew Hebrews. They thought it was a language too holy to be spoken. Okay? And they spoke Greek. And the, the Bible that they read in the synagogue, synagogue is a Greek word, synagogue. It means to go together in Greek. They didn't call it a poet. That's the Hebrew word for it. They called it a synagogue. They still call it synagogue, don't they? But they, they will complain today that they've never lost their language. Oh, gosh. They put it down for many years. They spoke Yiddish or Aramaic. They did not speak Hebrew. Right. They didn't use that language. Let's go on and look at this a little bit more. But when the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, when the fullness of time had come, he sent forth his son with authority, the God, Hosios. The word theology, which is what well, means what? Study of God, theos and logos. Here we, we have so many terms in English that come right out of Greek. Theos is God. All right? All right, ton wheel. Now, this word wheel there means more than son, doesn't it? There's different words for child in Greek. 
One of them is Navy Else. What does that mean? Speechless baby. There is Brave Else, which means a very newborn, briefly born. We got a word brief out of that word, brief, Brave Else. And there's the word techno in Greek. Techno means what? Born alive. Live birth. And then the word wheels, that means air. It does not just mean sun, it means air. It means the firstborn. It means the heir. Now, Jacob was the heir because Esau, the firstborn, hated his birthright. So he gave it for the cheapest commodity in the land of Palestine, which was a little blue. He despised, he hated his birthright. So God slapped him aside and went on. And Jacob was the heir. All right. When Abraham had a had a son, Ishmael, Ishmael, all right. When he had that son, that was a son of the mob woman. He would not be heir with the real son, the wheels. Isaac was the wheels, the wheels. Okay, that means the heir, the wheels. Tall wheel. That's a Tuesday singular masculine. By the way, look here. We have knowledge cases, we have identity, we have what else? A Tuesday. Now, Tuesday is a case of the object. And usually in the front, in Hebrew, before you got to have a direct object in Hebrew, you got this little word right here. What is that, Randall? It. It. It's like I hit something yesterday that made give me a belly I got hit it. All right, hit. All right, that's the sign of the direct object on page 84, if you want to look that one up in Brown, Driver, and Briggs, okay? Uh, that's a sign of direct object. Now, Greek doesn't have to have a sign or direct object in front of something, but in Hebrew, it most generally is always there, okay? Barashith bara Elohim et Hashemayim be et That's Genesis 1, by the way, okay? And we have two X in there. All right. Et Hashemayim, the heavens, and the Et Haharis, the earth. Okay. Now in Greek, the sign of the direct object is just like this. And it looks like just like it is in English. All right. How would you say that in English? Ace. Ace. And it's ace in Greek. By the way, some of the, of the German grammars call it ice. My teacher used to say there's no ice in ace. All right, this girl in pronunciation, no ice and ace. All right, let's go on here and look and see. But when it came the fullness of the time, he sent forth with authority, the God, the Son, accusing singular masculine. Okay, now we have how to, third personal pronoun there. How to, that's him. Him is how to. And that looks just like it would in English. See that? You can read that in English, couldn't you? How to. Right? Of him. Or from him, if you want to. It's actually from him. Or of him. The son belongs to God, but where did he come from? Him. From God. So that's opposite. Right. Case of origin. Genitive. And the which case, it, it, that's where he came from, okay? Genitive of opposite here basically tells you the same thing. The source of the son was God, okay? John 1 and 1. In beginning, in RK, ain hologos. In beginning, RK means, now in, in Genesis 1 and 1, it says Barashit, Bara. All right. What does Barashit mean, uh, Brother Randall? It's in beginning. In beginnings, plural. It's plural word. It's not, it's not singular. In Genesis 1 and 1, it means in one of the beginnings. Sometime back yonder in eternity past, God created the heavens and the earth. Some when one of those beginnings back there. One of the beginnings. They're the beginnings of angels and spirits and mankind and the earth and the heavens, the whole cosmos. There's a beginning of all that. In one of the beginnings, he created the heavens and the earth. All right. In one of the beginnings, Barashim Bara, Elohim, Et Hashemayim Be At Okay, in one of the beginnings, God created the heavens, plural, by the way. 
what he meant was the cosmos, the whole order. It's cosmos. The Greek our word cosmos means what? Order. Our word cosmetic. Cosmetology, all that means to set a person in order. You know, cosmetics. That's what you want to set your face in order, okay? All of that. Okay? Cosmos. It's plural in Genesis 1 and 1, but in John 1 and 1, a lot of people equate John 1 and 1 with Genesis 1 and 1, but they're not exact, they're not the same time. The oldest verse in the Bible, as far as time sequence is, is John 1 and 1. In our K, aim, third person singular, imperfect indicative action. That's a little verb there, aim. That's what it looks like right there. In beginning, kept on being continuously forever, whole logos. Whole logos. Whole logos. The word. That's a Hebrewism, that's not a Greek. <coughs> It's not a Greek idea. It is a Hebraism. What does a Hebraism mean? When they came to the name Jehovah, which we say so easily today, but we don't know how to say it. That's ridiculous. It's not Jehovah. But we know it. When I tell you that, you know what I'm talking about. That's this word right here. That's that word. Okay. It's not pointed. We don't know how to say it. When the Jews come to that word, they would call it Havavar, or Hashem, or Adonai. Okay? And what it means is the Creator. The Creator. All right? And Jehovah in Hebrew means what? What does it literally mean? Jehovah. He who shall become. It comes from to become. Okay? That's where it comes from. Now in the King James it translated, and the earth was formless and void. The earth became formless and void. It's not was, it became that way. Something happened to it to change from one state to another. The word Hayah means to change from one state to another. Jesus, in eternity past, was Adonai, Adonai, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. He calls him that in the book of Revelation. Many places in the book of Deuteronomy he calls him Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. All right, Adonai, Adonai. That's who he was. When the Jews come to the name Jehovah, they'll say Adonai, or Hashem, or Hadabar, the Word. So when John wrote that down, and here we have the Apostle Paul saying exactly the same thing that John one and one says. All right, this person in the the back in John, John Genesis three fifteen. What is Genesis 3.15? That is the first promise of a Messiah, isn't it? Hmm? Let's go read that. To look at it. Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15. What is your name, sir? Jim. Jim. That's a good name. Jim Newby. All right. Genesis 3.15. What kind of translation do you have there? I have the NIV. Okay, that's good. That's from a real good manuscript. All right, there are a lot of manuscripts in the Bible. You read that, tell you a little bit about it. All right, Genesis 3.15. Could you read that for me? 3.15? Yeah, Genesis 3.15. Okay, and I, and I were put in committee. Active hatred, enmity. What's that? Active hatred, enmity. Yeah, enmity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Between you and the woman. All right, who's God? Who's speaking there? Jehovah's speaking. Jehovah's speaking there, which is Jesus. That's the Son. The Son is talking to the devil. All right, now the devil has it has uh, infilled the, the serpent, Nahash. Say that's Nahash. Nahash. The hush. It means, and it says that mm -hmm. the serpent became deceitful, dishonest, and a liar. He wasn't made that way, but he became that way. Now, the Lord, Jehovah, the Word, is talking to Lucifer in that snake. All right? The other put active hatred between what? What does it say there, Jim? It says, uh, between you and the woman. Oh, between you and the woman. 
you and the woman, the woman in Hebrew, the word woman in Hebrew is Isha, the one word for man in Hebrew is Ish. Isha means out of man. Now the woman, she's going to put an active hatred between the woman and what? And you. And you? And what else? Uh, and, between, and, between the, and between your offspring. Okay. Your offspring and her offspring. And hers. Her, his offspring would be the Antichrist. Satan's really going to have a, a child in this world. Do you know that? He's an Antichrist going to get a child. Just like God's son is his child. All right. Between. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, he, he will crush your head and will strike your strike his heels. Okay. You, he will crush your head and he will deal a death dealing blow to you. That's his blow right here in the lake of fire. He's going to throw him in the lake of fire. That's the second death. He's going to do away with Lucifer one of these days, old Satan. Okay? But in the meanwhile, he's going to be dealt a crippling blow. When they drove those nails through his feet, do you think that was a crippling blow? And through his hands? Was that a crippling blow? Sure it was. Do you think it hurt? The whole Godhead felt that, I'm telling you. But what was that? That's the first promise of the Messiah in the Bible. That's what it's talking about right here in this verse. You could preach for eight hours on this verse right here from the Bible. John 1 1. In beginning kept on being the Word. And the Word, it says, Kai ho logos ain proton theo. And the Word, Jehovah, kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead. When Jesus came to this earth, when he became, when God became flesh in space and time, he walked around there in the garden with Eve, with Adam, but he wasn't incarnate yet. He wasn't in flesh yet. He, he, he could be seen. Here's the physical expression of the Godhead, but he's not related to man yet. In Genesis 4 and 1, Genesis 4 and 1, Eve thought the Messiah was born. She thought the Messiah was born. Genesis 4 and 1. Randall, do you have that? Right there, there's a the uh, sacred name Bible is real good at this. That's one of the best translations of that. New American Standard. New American Standard's a little bit off, but it'll it'll get you there. And the man had relations with his wife Eve, oh. and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, "I have gotten a man child, even the Lord." All right, I have gotten a man, even the Lord. She thought the Messiah was born. But what a mistake that was. Because the Messiah was going to be born without man. As an Adam all died. That's why Jesus, he was born of a woman. Related to the human race, as it's going to say here in the, in the fourth chapter of Galatians. But not related to in the human. Man puts blood in the body of a child. Woman does not contribute one bit of blood to the child. The man does. The blood comes from the man. Now, in the blood is what, according to the book of Genesis? Life. It's life. All right? But also in the blood, in your father, is also life. But it also has a sentence of death. It? You're going to die when you're born in this world. You may be born right now, but you're going to die sooner or later. It's terminal because we're related to Adam. But when Jesus was born, he had no human father. His father was God. God conceived himself in Mary and brought forth the promise of Messiah. Okay? When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth with authority the son of him, having become our woman. Look at that. Having become. That word in mind is there, having become. That's the word, that's the root for the word Jehovah. Having become ek dinaitos. What, do you, what is a woman doctor? What's she called? Gynecologist. Gynecologist. There's the word right there. Gynecos. Gynecos. Right there. Heratos is a medical term. Gynecologist. Gynecos. Out of a woman, but not out of a man. John 1 14 says, Kyle will go sarks again. And the word flesh. And Jehovah flesh he became. And by the way, that's middle voice. You got active voice, passive voice, you got middle voice. That's middle voice. How did God get himself into this world? 
he let himself out of eternity into space and time in that person of Jesus Christ. Here's God walking around. Here's Jehovah on the earth. And the earth and the, and the word, the Jehovah flesh he became. Now let's, John 1, 14, let's read the rest of that verse. John 1, 14, somebody. John 1, 14. Call it you want it. 1, 14. You got there, you there, brother? Okay. That the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, 118 now. Let me see, give you a little jar here. 118. The rest of you guys heard this a thousand times. <laughs> no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. All right. No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God is what it literally says. He has led himself out. The Lord. And that word, led himself out, that last word says he's declared him or displayed him. That comes from ek. Ek, right like this, and ago. Ek and ago, which means to lay, lead out. He has led himself out in the voice. John 1 and 14 says, And the word flesh he became for himself. And then John 1 is saying, And it says, The only begotten God. No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God, he has led himself out to display himself in human flesh. And we saw all of his glory. All right? All of his glory. Having become out of woman. Having become under law. God, the whole book of Ruth is about what? About redemption. Kinsman and redeemer. The Bible teaches to redeem someone, you had to be related to them. Now, you got Jehovah Witnesses, you got uh, all kinds, you got Mormons, you got uh, you got uh, Muslims. Let's just look at that just a little bit. The Muslim's idea of man is that God created man and God is a great holy God up there and he's so beautiful and so magnificent that you could never get near him. And he, he, and he can never get near you. He's too far holy and, and away from you. All right? And they say that no man is responsible for anybody else's sins. You're responsible only for your own sin. But the Bible says, as in Adam, all die. The Apostle Paul says, even though we don't sin according to the same way that Adam sinned in the garden, we are still responsible for what Adam did in the garden, and we have the sentence of death in us from Adam. Now, if these Muslims are not responsible for anybody else's sin, how come they die? If they're not related to Adam and they're not responsible for Adam's sins, how come they die? Mormons. God created himself when he created mankind to share his glory. And they were already spirit beings in the former life, former world, the spirit world. And they had got married down here with their spirit wives, and they brought forth spirit children. And uh, that's why Mormon women want to be really married to a Mormon man, because the only way a woman can get into heaven is for a Mormon man to resurrect her, because a woman has no soul. She is a pleasure thing. Okay? That's it. So they have to have somebody to resurrect them. Now, how about your Jehovah Witnesses? They created God that's so far away from them that wouldn't have anything to do with them. But the Bible's God, right here in, Gen in Galatians 4 and 4, says, When the fullness of time had come, God forced, sent forth his Son. How made of a woman? He wasn't no angel. He wasn't Michael. He wasn't some other spirit being. We have God in flesh, but related to the Genesis 3.15 story. We have the Messiah. We have God in flesh related to us to redeem us because we couldn't do it for ourselves. God's going to redeem us. The only perfect man that ever lived was Jesus Christ. 
having become out of a woman, having become under the law, according to the law of Moses, according to the book of Ruth. In the book of Ruth, you have a genealogy, don't you? Where are the two genealogies of Jesus Christ in the New Testament? Hey, 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 the New Testament. Where are the two genealogies of Jesus? Matthew is a, actually the genealogy of Joseph. That's Joseph's genealogy. Because he should have been on the throne. But the imposter on the throne was who? Herod, which was not a Jew. He was not a Jew. He was Esau's descendant, which was not the promised son, not the heir. But the devil got Esau's descendant on the throne of Israel, when Joseph should have been on the throne. So through the book of Matthew, which we have Matthew written from the Jewish kingly lineage idea, because Jesus, because his father was Joseph, in the earth, his father on the earth was Joseph. Now, Luke, the third chapter, whose genealogy is that? Mary. Huh? Mary's genealogy. Mary evidently didn't have any brothers. And Mary was the oldest daughter in her family. And when, her, when she married Joseph, her father adopted Joseph as his son. All right? We looked at the Leverite marriage there. And back in the Old Testament, it tells you that if a man doesn't have any sons, that his daughter, when she marries, uh, he will adopt that son, and he will be his son. So we have Joseph there, and it goes all the way back to the book, back to the book of Genesis and Adam. And there's where we're related to God. In Jesus Christ is where we become related to God, not like the Mormons. Not like the Jehovah Witnesses that have a God that's too high and holy to ever care for them. they got to work their way to heaven. Not like the Muslims, that he's some great big infinity out there that we can't understand. And we have to work, all of our good deeds have to outwear our bad deeds. When they get out there in the front of the Mosque of Omar one of these days, as they say, and they put a feather on one side and set them in the chair on the other side, their good deeds have got to outweigh their bad deeds, or else they're going to go with Okay? They won't be in the beatific vision. All right. We got started a little late. I'll go for a few minutes. Further, Genesis 3.15, Mark 1, uh, 1, 15, John 1, 14, John 1, 18, Romans 1 and 3, Romans 8 and 3, Philippians 2 and 7, Luke 2.21 and 2.27, Luke the third chapter and Matthew the first chapter, the genealogies, Ruth, the whole book, all surfaces to this verse, all right? And Colossians, the first chapter, verses 13 through 22, it talks about the creator God that came down here. And John 1 and verse 4, and on there, it talks about our Creator God that became flesh and came unto His creation. All right? Let's go on one more verse so we get out of this mistake that I made here, okay? Hena. Hena. Tus. Hepo. Hepo. By the way, when you got hypoglycemia, what do you have? Hypoglycemia. Low blood sugar. Hyperglycemia is high blood sugar. That's where the term comes from, right there, hypo. Right. Hypo, no mo, no mo, that is. Ex ago rase, hina, pain, weothesion, apolabomen. All right. In order that the ones under the law, the ones he pulled under the law, under the penalty of the law, he might buy out of the slave market, might redeem, might ransom back. Agora is a slave market, by the way, in Greek, Agora. All right? Agrarian society is what? An agricultural society right out of Greek. So many of our English words come right out of Greek and you don't even know it. When you start studying Greek, then you see all the medical terms and a lot of our terms. He not pain of He places us as sons. 
All right, the placing as sons we might receive. Apo lambano. Apo we might from. Lambano receive. All right. First person plural, second heiress, subjunctive active. What is the deciding factor of your salvation? God calls. Well, God calls and you answer. That's right. When he says David, and you answer. Now he calls all men, but not all men respond. To him. This is the sacrifice is sufficient for all men, but it is not efficacious to all men. As simple as that. It is not. Only if you repent and call upon him to save you, he's not going to force you to be saved. Right. And subjunctive mode, in Greek, it tells you every time it talks about salvation, it's in the subjunctive mode. You, and that is the mode it may be or may not be. Subjunctive mode. Greek will really straighten out your theology. <laughs> as simple as that. All right. That we might receive. Placing as us. Pleothesia. Thesia means to place as a heir. Not just a son, but an heir. That tabernacle there in the Old Testament typified the church at the church age in the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, him and the church secondarily. The temple represents the eternal glorified abode of God in his elect. That's New Jerusalem. All right. New Jerusalem. That's the temple. The tabernacle was a what? A transitory thing. Move from place to place. But the temple of God that Jesus said he was going to build for us is a permanent structure. Permanent structure. All right. First person plural, second aorist. All right, second aorist. Repent and believe. Second aorist. We may repent and believe and receive. All right. Placing us as sons, and then he might might buy us. Look at this here again. Third person singular, first aorist. He told you he redeems you one time. You can't be saved ten times. You're going to get saved one time. One time, cultural reaction. First heiress, subjunctive. How is he going to do it? He might redeem us if we respond. If we respond. He will redeem us if we respond. All right. Romans 8 and 15 and 23, 9 and 4, Ephesians 1 and 5. Romans 8 and 14 and Galatians 3 26 all cross reference to this verse. The Bible says no scripture is in any private interpretation. If you take out one scripture out of the Bible and try to make it teach something that nothing else in the Bible teaches, you're on the wrong road. Every scripture should have several scriptures to back it up. The first four in verse four, we didn't get very far tonight, people. Because four and four was full play roll thing. Full play roll box. Full up with stuff. You could, I could go out there and set Fairfax back to the church and preach a whole hour on that verse, brother. If you just easy, you might preach a whole revival on that verse. We'll start at 4 and verse 6 next week, okay? Is this today the 12th? All right. Now, by the way, all of you are now are part of, of, of discovertheword.com, and you're going to go out over the air in a few few weeks, and uh, Randall is the webmaster there, by the way, that's the guy. And you'll be out there helping people learn Greek out all over the world. Do you have any questions? Just uh, read your little book there, your two first two stories there. I will try to get you an in linear next week, so you can follow right along with us. And you, before you know it, you will be learning to read Greek. Bob, you getting any more this week? A little bit? All right, David. David, you can read all that, could you? Um, most of it. <laughs> yeah. Marilyn, could you read all those words? Oh, I, I was there. I was there. Okay. And Randall? I'm sure you could read them all. Yeah. He's uh, in my, been in my Greek class and, and my Hebrew class now for, uh, I guess the Hebrew class has been about six months or more. Anyway, and, and David, you've been in my Greek class how long? Oh, 
six years. Yeah. Well, you should be good. I tell you what. Why do you think I'd say, what's the same thing? What is that rule of grammar? All right. Ace. Right there, that little word ace. Extension and limitation of thought or verbal action. That's the idea of it. And we're going to see that. Acts 2.38, baptized for the remission of sins. The idea is baptized because of the remission of sins. In Greek, you have the idea. Extension and limitation of thought or verbal action. And ace the face of because the sins have been sent away. By the way, that word ace the face is in the Old Testament, Leviticus. That's what talks about the scapegoat. We have forgiveness of sins because the, the, skin, the scapegoat takes away our sins. We are baptized because the scapegoat took away our sins. And the Seventh Day Adventurers, okay, all right, they have Satan, our co redeemer, because Satan goes to the eternal pit as the scapegoat. Our scapegoat. Nobody goes to hell but him. How many of you do that? He is the one that goes and, and, and suffers hell for every unbeliever. Jesus is my redeemer. And he is my sin. He is my redeemer. All of it. The whole human man. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Come back again next week. I'm glad I finally got you in the classroom, brother. And uh, would you mind dismissing us in this in prayer tonight? Would that be all right? All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. And we humbly pray that you open our hearts to everything you have for us this week. And we pray that this word um, that Brother Jim has given us, that you just put it in our hearts, that we can tell others about it.